Hello Python coders. So kind of a shorter video for today but what I wanted to do is talk about some comments that have been made on my other videos. So let's go ahead and get started. Alright first off uh, on my don't use TK enter video there was a gentleman who fairly recently posted a comment that said Actually, it, I, I'm pronouncing cute wrong. It's actually QT. Well, it's actually, it's pronounced cute. And let's start by looking at the Wikipedia article. And if we go to the Wikipedia article for cute, the software, not the company, but cute, you'll see that cute pronounced cute. Now, Wikipedia isn't always the the most accurate source of information. So let's take a look at this first citation, which is actually cute about us from the cute company itself. If we go down here to the background, it says first developed in 1994, cute as in cute. So this is the company itself telling you that it is actually pronounced cute. I found it funny that the guy actually went out of his way to tell me that I was pronouncing it incorrectly, but if you do hear QT, that's incorrect. Um, as a side note with that, you want to be careful with YouTubers because I have seen there's a lot of cute tutorial videos out there. And one of the tests that I use to see how experienced is this person working with cute is how do they pronounce it? And many times I go on to their YouTube tutorial videos and I hear QT, 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 QT. And I kind of sit back and laugh because I often wonder to myself, how experienced with cute are they really? My mentor for learning cute was a man by, by the name of Alan D. Moore. And Alan has applications in his production environment at work that are written with PyCute. So I know he has a lot of experience in working with cute. And he also pronounced it cute. All right. OK, so next we want to talk about PyCute or PySide. Which do we use? Now, to start out with, PyCute actually comes from a third party company called Riverbank Computing. PySide comes directly from the Qt company itself. So why do we have two? Well, in the beginning, Riverbank Computing created PyQt. They created the first set of Python bindings to wrap around Qt's C++. This eventually caught the attention of the Qt company, and they wanted to license these as the official Python bindings. The problem is, is that the two companies could not come to an agreement on the licensing model. Qt uses one, uh, Riverbank was using another. So what Qt company said is, okay, fine, if we can't license yours, we will just do our own, and they created PySide. Um, back in the PyQt 5 and PySide 2 days, um, the one that I would be using and the one I started out with was PyQt. Uh, mainly because it was a better implementation, it was more complete implementation. The documentation for both back then still was terrible. Quite, quite frankly, was awful. Um, the documentation today from PySide is actually very good. So what they did is they took their C++ documentation, which is what we all used to use anyway and just translate it into Python and they copied it modified it so that it's Python documentation so even Riverbank Computing's documentation to me is still pretty terrible uh, now compared to Qt so that's why I've transitioned over to PySide once PyQ or PySide 6 came out um, there is a difference in licensing like I said and from what I understand this may not be 100% accurate, but from what I understand, if you go to do commercial software that you're going to sell, uh, if you use PyQt, you have to buy a license from Riverbank, and then you also have to buy a license from Qt. 
So if you use PySide, like PySide 6, and you're doing commercial software, you only have to get a license from the Qt company. So that actually might be an easier option for you for licensing, because it's kind of a one-stop shop type of thing, I guess you could say. Now, on another side note, what does PySide even mean? Even mean? Well, Qt is actually a Finnish company, and Side in Finnish. I've heard this say that it means binding. Um, actually, the the word is more pronounced side, and it means something more to connecting. So technically, I guess we should be saying pi side, but most English speakers just call it pi side. I myself call it pi side all the time, and me being Finnish, a good chunk Finnish anyway, you know, that's why I was more interested in it. Okay, so next, how do we organize our code? So the question came up, and I don't remember which video it was in, but the question came up, do I cram everything into one Python file? And I don't believe they said cram, I think they just said, do I put everything in one Python file? And um, I said no. You absolutely do not want to put everything into one Python file. It's not that you can't, it's that it's going to make a couple of things a lot more difficult. So what I like to do is I break up my application based on the functionality of the application. And I'll, I'll show you an example here in a minute. It's going to make your code a lot more maintainable because you've broken things up into individual chunks. And it's going to make it much easier for you to reuse code. And I'll show you that in a minute. No, don't cram everything in one Python file. And also, don't go overboard dividing things up. I got a comment on a video where the gentleman was asking me, and it, it was a little bit confusing. I, I think I kind of got the gist of what he wanted to do, but it seemed like he wanted to take um, a QMain window and then each menu option that he had, he seemed to want to break that up into individual classes. And I said, well, no, you, you really don't need to go to that level. What I generally do as a rule of thumb is I will take and make a new class and a new Python file for each QMain window, Q dialog, or Q widget window that I'm doing then all the application logic goes into those separate Python files. So if we go into PyCharm, you can see here that I've got this application broken up. Now this is the main Python file for this application. And if we run it, all we're doing is we are adding people into a simple database table. So if I hit submit, you'll see new person Jason Smith added. If I check that table, Jason Smith has been added to the database. I actually created this for a different video on error handling, but serves the purpose here pretty well. You'll see that many things are broken up into individual folders. You have a database folder. This database folder handles my connection to my database, so when I need to establish a connection to the database. Also, I have a script in here that lets me edit my database connection. So this will store my host name, my database name, the user ID, and the password. That gets put into a settings folder into a JSON file. So there's my host, my database, user ID, and password are encrypted and then auto commit I set to true. That's in its own folder. Uh, logging, well first off icons, they're in their own folder, so is icons.qrc. Logging, this is my setup logging function that I call at the beginning to get myself a custom logger object. So that's in its own individual folder. Logs, those are in their own individual folder. And then persons, this is the main application itself to add 
a person into the database. And then utilities, I have this for setting up my paths and sending messages to myself. So if I run this to test it, you'll see that this is the type of error messages that I would use. This is a warning message. If I click show details, they'll give me more details of the message. So it looks like there's a lot of moving parts here, but really there's an advantage to doing so. Number one, if I need to change any little bit of this, it's easy to pick the folder I need, go in and make those code changes, but also it helps me with reusing code. So the database, the icons, the logging, the logs folder, the settings, and the utilities, I can take and copy those from this existing project into another new project, and I've already got all that stuff done and written. Because with most of the Qt applications that I do, I'm going to be reading or writing to a database, so I'm going to have to establish a database connection. I always have a custom logging object. I do a lot of logging. So with that in mind, I can reuse all that code. So no, we do not want to take and put everything into one Python file. That would be very difficult to maintain. And it would also be a tremendous amount of code. Just this, to add a person into the database, is all of this. So you can imagine if I had all the utilities and things that I need and I put them all into one big Python file. That would be kind of a mess. So no, don't, don't do that. But also, you don't have to go crazy dividing things up either. You can split things up, like I said, somewhat logically. All right, so another question that has come up from time to time is databases. What database should I use? Well, that kind of depends on the situation that you're in. Um, is the application going to be used by multiple people or is it just you? And in some cases, does that even matter? Like for me, I use MySQL server. And a, somebody pointed that out in a video. They said, ah, I see you're using MySQL server. Is there a reason that you're doing that? Well, I just happen to know MySQL server and I happen to like MySQL server, so that's what I use here at home. Um, I could use Postgres SQL. Um, the one that is included with the Python standard library is SQLite. I could use SQLite. In fact, in some in some applications that you're going to maybe distribute to uh, friends, family, or you're going to sell, that might be one that you want to use because it's very simple to use. But in my case, I like MySQL server, so I have a MySQL server. Um, another question you might want to ask yourself is, do you need to store massive amounts of data or are you going to be putting in very little? SQLite is really great um, when you're not going to be putting in massive amounts of data. Not a bad little database, um, especially for like a home application. A lot of times you're, you might make this decision on what you already know. So I was already familiar with MySQL Server. It's not the main database that I work with on a daily basis, but I knew it well enough to be able to install it at home. I run the community edition and I like the MySQL Workbench, so made sense for me. Now, the one thing I wanted to point out here is that you can actually use multiple databases. In fact, I saw an application a few months ago where he's working with two databases. He has an SQLite database distributed with his application and he uses that SQLite database to store all of his settings and uh, the local application settings and also he stores in his database connection details to his main database. So I like that approach actually because then like in my case if we go back and look at this application what I'm doing here is under settings I have my database connection I'm just sticking it into a JSON file. What he does with his application is he has an SQLite database that he distributes with the app 
and inside of there he stores the host database user ID password and other values on connecting to his main database and I kind of like that approach actually it eliminates having to have JSON files to store uh, individual settings so that's an approach I might actually incorporate into some of these examples but getting back to it you know it just kind of depends on what you know um, I was looking at this tool fairly recently called SQLite Studio and this is a utility a fairly modern utility for creating and maintaining SQLite databases so if, in code you can actually create SQLite databases you can add tables to them you can maintain maintain tables using all code when I create the database and I create a table in it I generally like to use a tool like this like in my case I use MySQL Studio or MySQL Workbench but this is seemingly a pretty decent tool for working with SQLite there's other tools out there like dbeaver community um, there's uh, several for SQLite so you just kinda have to poke around and experiment with what you like but yes you can actually connect to multiple databases not not a problem alright so one thing that has happened a lot on some of these videos is questions technical questions like I'm trying to do this this and this and this and this is happening that's happening and sometimes I have time to research those things sometimes I do not um, the one thing to remember is that I'm kind of a busy guy I do have a full-time job I got a lot to do around here and I'm a pretty big Minecraft player so when I'm done for the day and I want to do something else I'm usually playing Minecraft especially during the winter so if you do have technical questions and I can't seem to get to it there are some places you can go Qt has its own forum that you can register for and they have a Python bindings section there is the Qt discord server and on there they have a specific channel for Python bindings there's a telegram group uh, I am part of it but I don't really pay that much attention to it but there have been some good questions that have been asked in there there's uh, Facebook groups for Python GUI programming um, also if you're researching your question uh, Stack Overflow might actually be a very good place for you to go to the one thing I do want to point out though is whatever you do please go out there and search using your favorite search engine try and search your problem first most likely you are not the first person who has run into this problem and maybe it was solved a few years ago and you, you have to do some digging but the main thing is if, if you don't do any research and you just post the question out there and somebody finds the answer within two minutes on simple Google Google search they're gonna beat you up for not doing your own research first so you only want to post questions forums discord Facebook telegram stack overflow when you absolutely can't find the answer yourself so just running to somebody like me and saying hey this doesn't work and I say well you know a five-minute Google search or a two-minute Google search would have uh, solved your problem not gonna be good so please try to do your own research first alright so that's all the topics that I have to cover for today I do appreciate all of your comments on the videos if you do have a question go ahead and post it and maybe I'll do another one of these types of videos in the future when we get some more comments I do have some other content planned things uh, are in the works it's just been really busy time this time of year so anyway that's all I have for today other than that happy coding